Irving Bach's Cello Suites. Most cellists will agree that the six suites for cello solo by Bach can be considered the core component of the cello repertoire. Since their first modern time performances by Casals at the beginning of the 20th century, they stand as the one collection of works that every cellist will attempt to play at some stage and that no cellist will ever fully outgrow. The singularity of these works is further underlined by their en enigmatic origin. We don't know how Bach came to write them, why, or for whom. They somehow came into existence unprecedented, with no precursors from which the evolution could be traced. And even 300 years later, they still stand alone, with no works of similar stature ever having followed them up. They are a once-off chance appears of utter perfection, an unequalled gift to cellists, as well as an unequal challenge. In this presentation I wish to engage with a specific problem arising from yet another singularity, the fact that Bach's original autograph is lost, and that today the only source is a set of four different manuscript copies. The oldest is that of the organist Johann Peter Kellner. The second is a copy by Anna Magdalena Bach, Johann Sebastian's second wife. And more recently, two more copies have appeared. However, none of the copyists were string players, and clearly the manuscripts were not intended as practical performance material. While all are very consistent with regard to the notes, they are remarkably inconsistent with regard to the phrase markings or the bowings. To demonstrate this, I have described the last two movements of the first suite from three of the sources and have juxtaposed them for easier comparison. The equal sign indicates the bars that correspond in all regard in all three versions. You will notice that this is the exception rather than the rule. Of the 24 bar minuets, only four bars are consistent in minuet 1, only seven in minuet 2. Of the Gigues, 34 bars, only eight correspond exactly. So with regard to the phrasings discrepancies between the sources by far outnumber consistencies. Unfortunately, these word texts don't really help us understand how to bow the suites. So we find ourselves in a situation where we know exactly which notes we should play, but not at all how we should play them. To a certain extent, this might be true for all written music, since this dilemma quite accurately points to the limitations of musical notation. But in the case of the cello suites, the problem is compounded by the existence of these diverging sources, none of which is pointing towards a consistent approach with regard to bowing, phrasing or articulation. No matter how hard you might try to gain some authoritative information on topic, there is no way around this problem other than to come up with your own bowings. Now you might argue that since more than 70 editions have been published and thousands of cellists have played the suites, surely they must by now have evolved some standard ways or best practices of playing them. If under all these multitude of options you have in fact found your ideal version, good for you. I certainly haven't found it, in spite of so many thoughtful interpretations and masterful performances. Instead, I've come to the realization that for these works, there will never be an ultimate or final interpretation. For some reason, the suites beg to remain open for a wide scope of different perceptions and renditions. They seem to require ever new and individually informed readings. It is in this vein that I'd like to encourage you not to follow any of the many published versions blindly, as this will rob you of the valuable experience and opportunity to create your own edition. And with this I mean the whole process of translating the written score into a sonic realization, quite literally figuring out how you want them to sound. Since you will be the one playing the music, nobody else can nor should be doing that on your behalf. And simply following the suggestions of a printed edition might appear as an easy shortcut, but it might very well end up putting a barrier between you and the music. Considering that every musician has a uniquely individual set of skills technical proficiencies, tastes and musical preferences which form the very condition of that person's way of making music, there is very little point in adopting someone else's frame of reference. So to reiterate this point, for you to arrive at your very own way of playing the suites, 
you must take on the task and the responsibility of being your own editor. This may seem an overwhelmingly daunting task, considering that the suites are by now 300 years old, truly ancient, and stylistically very far removed from modern day aesthetics. Hence this presentation, to offer you some guidelines and information on historical performance conventions, as well as a practical editing demonstration on the two short movements shown earlier. I trust that all of you will have the one or other printed edition of the cello suites. In all probability it will look a bit like this, torn and falling apart from frequent use, with many layers of pencil markings and corrections of layers and more corrections. Perhaps you're even the proud owner of one of these lavish Bierenreiter editions that comes complete with copies of the three manuscripts. But if not, don't worry. Today, scans of these manuscripts can be accessed freely on IMSLP. And I would like to suggest that you have a look at them, and perhaps even print out Anna Magdalena's copy for reference purposes. In fact, IMSLP offers 28 different editions, plus 22 more arrangements and transcriptions. But since my talk is all about creating your own edition, I would like to point out only one especially useful, useful version on IMSLP, which is a full score without bowings, uploaded by the Japanese cellist Shinichiro Yokoyama. I urge you to download and print this, then put your own name down as editor, and then embark on a journey of rediscovering the suites on your very own terms. Before we get to the practical demonstration, I'd like to point out some basic Baroque performance conventions, which I think should principally inform any editorial approach. Firstly, it is fine to play open strings. In fact, in Baroque music, open strings are preferable to stop ones whenever possible. The longer a string is, the more freely it will resonate, which is what you want when playing on gut strings on the period instrument. But I suggest that you adopt that principle even when playing on a modern cello with steel strings. Stay in the low positions, use open strings whenever possible. This unwritten ban of open strings for fear of interrupting the vibrato is a modern idea which is not applicable to Baroque music. And the problem of harsh or bland sounding open strings can very easily be addressed with careful bowing bowing, even on steel strings. Secondly, remember that the suites were conceived with a baroque bow in mind. This bow has a much lighter tip than the modern bow, as you can see here, and therefore offers a marked difference between up and down bows. Every down bow, by default, implies a heavy beginning with a potential living window. Every up bow can be rather light and potentially lead into a crescendo. So this technical feature underlines a stylistic feature of Baroque music, where the hierarchy of more and less emphasized notes should be observed. Hence the fact that up and down bows may sound quite different is not a deficiency. On the contrary, this particular differentiation should be put to good use to articulate and phrase in a nuanced manner. Again, I suggest that you uphold this differentiation even when playing with a modern bow, with which you could make up and down bows sound the same. Don't. Think of your bow as a calligraphy pen, enabling you to articulate finely, rather than a thick paintbrush, which might only be suitable for broad and dashed strokes. Thirdly, Develop an eye for musical hierarchies, both with respect to pitches and to beats. In tonal music, every note implies a chord, and thereby a scale degree. Even an unaccompanied melody will imply an underlying harmonic progression. As a rule, any note that indicates a harmonic shift, and hence conveys new information, is considered more important than notes that don't change the harmony. It is therefore very useful to be aware of scale degrees, whether you're in tonic, dominant, submediant, or whatever, be aware to which each note belongs and through which degree the music moves at the moment. The Baroque hierarchy of beats is common knowledge, I think, but often it has been conveyed rather too simplistically. 
While it is true that the first beat of a bar might be the strongest, this actually only applies if it is supported harmonically as well. Should the harmony not change for several bars, there is little point in emphasizing first beats, as these contain no new information. And if the harmony changes on a weak beat, such as the second or the fourth, this might in fact strengthen that beat, overturning the expected emphases. Therefore, harmonic and rhythmic hierarchies must always be considered in conjunction. And my fourth and last point, train yourself to view the shape of musical figures as a kind of musical topography, a musical landscape. Try to perceive musical lines or figures in a spatial manner. Repeated notes on the same, on the same pitch indicate a flat plane. They might represent a rhythmical figure, but certainly don't contain any melodic information. A small interval amounts to small unevenness over which you might still be able to drag your feet, in other words, slow your bow. The bigger the interval gets, the more you will have to lift up your feet, the shorter your bow strike should be, until you get to real boulder hopping, where even your bow will have to jump, be lifted off the strings. This rule of thumb, the smaller the interval, the broader the stroke, will get you a far way to find specific articulations in accordance with specific musical detail. Of course, there are many exceptions to be observed as well. Large intervals can often be part of a broken chord, in which case slowing them might actually be more appropriate to bring unity to, to that implied chord. Or dedicated articulations may request a certain way of playing which either confirms or contradicts the rule of thumb. And then, if you purposefully wish to break the rule by jumping along on the plane or sliding down a boulder just for fun, who should object? After all, the rule is just meant to be a guideline, not a prescriptive law. So let's have a look at the Minuet and the Gigue again and see how these considerations might help us to work out sensible bowings. Here you see a clean edition of Minuet 1 and 2 of the first suite. Um, no bowings, just the notes. And I often use this as a starting point with my students. So I'll go through the exercise of just suggesting bowings for this piece. I prefer to slow the first three to bring out the chord. One could also play them separate to bring out the jumps, but I think to establish the chord is a nice thing. Then you slow the little figures, which are stepwise, and you have these nice two and twos. So it'll be ta da ring tum ta da ti ti ha and these of course you'll have to separate. It's not a it's a jump. These will be separate and lead up to the emphasized chord. The trill is another way of emphasizing it which resolves. Then we'll repeat that, bring out the chord, slur the little steps and these nice two and two fingers. We we'll have that brings us to this. We have one more, then note that the line Going downward now changes to upward, so we're going to keep that separate, bring us to the cadence. And repeat that idea of, the, of slurring the chord, and then we have another opportunity for these two. But now the figure changes again, so the bowing will change, and we're now coming to a modulation indicated by G sharp, it's going to lead to the A minor chord. Um, and we can bring out this chord here again and have an up here. And now we have a nice big jump and a line which may be slurred and while we end up with a down bow here we might just as well carry on with an upper and bring this tie this chord together which leads us to the E minor section so we could just indicate that by slurring this bit um, but then we need an upper for this next bar and there will be an opportunity for those twos and twos so this becomes a feature D and T hum on B bar minor in E minor, um, the relative minor, and now this takes us back to G major in the first inversion, so we're going to bring out that chord again, stick to our old pattern, but here it's different, we don't have a stepwise movement, this is the suspension, this is the changing note, and that is only the resolution, so we'll keep those separate, have an upper for the figure, repeat, the same idea on the sequence, so whenever there's a sequence, try to honor that by bowing sequentially. Again, same situation, suspension, changing out and resolution only there. And then, sorry, let's put a comma, um, an upbeat for the end. We can bring out that chord, bring out this chord. These will be separate, of course, but not to the end.
Coming to Winnaway 2, we're obviously going to slew the first three. Leave that changing that and keep those separate. Bring out the jumps. I'm going to repeat that pattern in the first part. Um, we could also slow these um, to bind the cord, but in this case I prefer to keep them separate. Mm. Note that this is an E natural, not an E flat. Actually Bach, although it's in G minor, prescribes only one flat. Um, many editions have two flats and if you get this as an E flat, it's not true. Okay, that's basically the first part. The second part, I like bringing out that dominant seventh chord. And when it gets to the ninth, the pattern actually changes, so we're going to keep that separately. And then one could slow these. Um, and this is actually quite nice. This is obviously a down bow, being the dominant. Which resolves to the tonic. So, strong down bow and a light up bow helps us to bring out that phrasing. And then we will obviously repeat that on the sequence. Slow these four, do the same thing, and these are all the light uh, up bow. But now we have to do another up for our upbeat. Tin tan tan tiaran tiaran. And now I'd like to honor the beginning by slurring these three, even though they're not on one. But that's an interesting little variation. You could also but I quite like this little variation and the similarity. These will keep separate and then we can bring out the chord here, B flat major. And since we end with a down bow, we might just carry on with an up. Once again, tie these together as part of a chord. Um, and leaving the so from G to C minor, and we can bring out this chord here, and then so we're going to do them up here, and obviously repeat that on the sequence, and it's going to be the same up again and down, and we're going to bring out the chord, but now we have to retake. Because the F sharp obviously is an important note, it's the uh, leading note to taking us back to G, so we're in the dominant now. We tie these together for the chord. So obviously, this, these three upbeats recur, and that's also creating unity. We're going to slow that chord, bring these back, and then of course, the last bar has this beautiful jump, and the line brings us back. Nicely. Um, so the sequence, repeat it. So the chord has been established on the one already, so there's no point in playing these very loudly because there's no new harmonic information. That F sharp, of course, is important, so therefore we need to retake and have another number. In the Gique, one could obviously emphasize the first beat, which is often done. I actually prefer to do this. In other words, bring out that little uh, stepwise movement. And then I also introduce a little rhythmic variation uh, with my bowing, so as to not make it too predictable. Most sources have staccati here, so I'll keep to that. These I would also keep separate. Um, that brings a sprightly energy to that piece. Because a little crescendo once again, we have an emphasis indicated by the chord and the trill and the long note, and then the resolution. We like that. In this section, I would once again stick to my little idea, but now I have to change it. This is the this is the chord, and then there's a sequence. So again, I have a nice. Interesting variation, which is very pleasant to bow. Um, short, long, 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 short, so that really not, works out nicely. And then I would stick to the staccati here again. One can bring out this chord. And then we have this beautiful line of rising suspensions. 
Um, note that the pattern changes here. This is actually part of a longer line, so we'll change my bowing here. So we'll have these um, bring us to a down bow here, and now we're going to have it up, even though it's on the first beat of the bar, but that's fine because this is actually the most important note, the dominant leading to the tonic, so that will be the emphasized one, and we will have to do this. The second part we can continue with that idea. So again, we'll have that. And even here. So this idea. And of course, this is very obvious. We have a big jump and then we have a small step. So that little sequence. Beautiful spot needs to be burned like that and we could so we always have obviously down up down up one could slow them to continue the line so that means you would have an up here which is fine brings us nicely to that cadence in e minor um note that e minor is reached here already so this e doesn't bring any new information so there's no need to emphasize it and you can phrase on yantara ram pum pum pum. We can continue with that idea of this, sorry, this little slur. And also, it's a nice way to to sort of uh, as an upbeat to that energetic figure. Yantara ram pum pum pum. Para repeat that. And the third time, tara ram pum 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 pum. Um, we have that same uh, section with the rising. Line, so these will definitely be down bows. We've reached the top, so we're going to change the, the pattern. Bring out this falling line. This is, um, sorry, yes, the falling line is one thing, but this is the emphasized note that we need to reach. Um, we'll have to have a down bow here to get in. Here we can bring out the chord, so we also end up with a down bow again on the, on the one of that beat, of that bar rather. Now obviously we will bring out this rising line, note from the B to the C sharp to the D sharp to the E to the F sharp, all the way leading to the tonic again. So these will obviously be down bows. Ta-da! So we'll emphasize that line by slurring these little steps, and then the jump obviously is a separate bow. So all of this will bring us to a down bow here, and we can just stick to that, have a nice yum ta ba ba dum so a light up bow here, and that neatly brings us back to where we want to be. Again, we've reached G major already, no need to emphasize the second G, no new information there. And finally, let's have a listen to this edition. And now, obviously, the practicalities come into play. You might find out that some of the ideas that looked fine on paper turn out to be rather awkward to play. So this practical part is probably the most important part of the exercise, where you must negotiate between what you want to do and what you can do convincingly. Be open to yield in both directions. Sometimes a good idea just needs a little bit of practice and will then actually boost your technical proficiency. However, sometimes practical considerations might lead you to an even better sounding practical solution. So assume both roles, that of editor and performer, and engage in an ongoing dialogue on how best to reconcile what you can do technically and what you would like to express musically, emotionally, stylistically. Ideally, both aspects will complement and enrich each other. Thinking about music will always enhance your playing, and playing the music will time and again change the way you think about it. Enjoy. Minuet 1, and I'll perform on my beautiful unnamed rock cello, which probably dates from the 18th century, and which probably originates from Thuringia, which is Bach's country. Note, this is not made to be a performance, but rather a demonstration of the editorial solution that I've demonstrated just now. 
So I'm going to start by slowing the chord in spite of the big jumps. <laughs> take into account all the string crossings. Here's a big jump and close connection. Now with this chord again. End of the phrase, we're in E minor, now we go back. Chord. First inversion of G. Again the chord. <laughs> 